Hello there, welcome to the Vaults for Master, the story about taking a 5th edition game and scraping it off the plate and piling on a whole new helping of Pathfinder 2nd edition. Uh, last episode, last session, I introduced the idea of remastering my homebrewed races, specifically the Swerf Niblin, the Deep Gnome, and turning it into a Pathfinder version, an ancestry with corresponding heritages known as the Genishio. Today, session two, or well, session 1B, technically, the second part of that episode of this little mini series, what were the results of my endeavors? I left off with a little bit of a, a, a cliffhanger. We started off with my, my homebrew for my Smurf Niblin, outlined here with your typical fifth edition. Uh, abilities and stats, although I did homebrew and put in the Spurf Niblin magic as part of the stock uh, race or sub race abilities, which from the Elemental Evil uh, handbook from 5th edition, this would have been an optional feat that you would have perhaps picked at 4th level or 8th level or whenever you would pick up a feat in D&D terms. Uh, and I just slapped those two together Put it on a little bit of a, a timer as far as the levels when you'd get the certain spells. And bang, this was my vaults version of the Swerf Niblin. Nothing super crazy or special other than making it a little bit more powerful than the, the standard Swerf Niblin that D&D offers. And that's mostly because, well, two reasons. One, a lot of the 5e races, I thought, especially some of the, the ones that were based upon monsters and like a monster manual, they just missed the mark and left uh, left off some of the cool powers that monsters might have. So if you were to go and fight a Spurf Niblin, normally they would have magical abilities like this. So a, a PC version should have the same uh, options, I felt. And then the other reason why I gave uh, the Spurf Niblin of my game, plus some of my other uh, races would have gotten special abilities as well, it's because my game world is was very grimdark. It's survivor, you know. Uh, you don't have a lot of resources, so my player characters they needed a little more oomph, and so I put that into a lot of the different uh, races that they were playing. So this was my starting point, and then we talked about how I wanted to then take that and turn it into this Pathfinder version, known as the Ganicio, and I and I wanted to develop an entire ancestry. Uh, lore, the mannerisms, physical description, the society, the naming conventions, the belief system, get into the mechanics, the stat block for it, plus all the ancestries and all the heritages, all the different, sorry, the ancestry feats and all the heritages, and just knock this sucker out of the park. And so I left off by saying, hey, I was going to take all this lore that I had for Spurf Niblin from D&D, from Pathfinder, from my own game world, and put it into Chatty Kathy, who is my AI muse, ChatGPT Kathy, loaded in there and told her, hey, can you turn it into this template with all of my information I just dumped in there? And then give me the mechanics for a Pathfinder ancestry. And that is what today's episode is about. What happened? What were the results of that effort? So let's go ahead and take a look at how I did this, what my, my specific inputs were, so that you guys can see exactly how it was that I went about creating what I believe is a masterpiece, a master choice. Let's take a look. So here we go. Pull up my, my Word document here. All right, here we go. Zoom this over so you can see it a little bit better. Zoom out here. One second. Dude. There we go. All right, so here is what I wanted. I wanted this Pathfinder Homebrewed Ancestry, right? Duh. And I wanted six heritages for my vault setting. So I had to program into Kathy all the background information needed for her to do this. And then beyond that, my specific flavor I was going for for these Ganicio, these Swerf Niblin remakes was I wanted them, especially this is the beauty with Pathfinder. Sorry to kind of go off on a tangent, but with Pathfinder, you're not locked into just that that prototypical Swerf Niblin or Wood Elf or whatever that 
you know, the race uh, statistics talk about. Because of the feed system, because of the ancestry feed system, you can you can have so many different varieties. So anyway, you start with your stock ancestry, my Smurf Nibblin. And then I, I was talking to Kathy here and I said, well, I want to make sure in my game world, some specialization, some uniquenesses is uh, part of this this ancestry. So I wanted to make sure that one of the things in my my mind anyway, was that the the Sverp Niblin, my Genicio, they were practitioners of crystal and light magic. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, they they are like the brilliant. They're a little light in the deeps, right? This is why they're they're so well uh, received by Kavarka, one of my primordials. I discussed uh, a few videos ago. So if you haven't taken a look at those videos about Kavarka or the Illuminate Lattice, his cult. Uh, and during those videos, I mentioned this, my Smurf Nibble and my Genicio at the time and how they would they would fit right in with his cultists. But anyway, uh, they are practitioners of crystal and light magic. So I wanted to make sure that that was part of this ancestry, that there was some sort of rune carving they could do, some sort of radiant magic. Uh, this also would tie into perhaps some of the illusionist uh mythology that goes you know hand in hand with I, the older school versions with uh smurf niblin when deep gnomes were known or probably still are in fifth edition rules where you look at those uh smurf niblin magical abilities they're all about illusion so twisting and bending light through crystals and re reflective surfaces and refractive um you know crystalline objects that definitely needs to be a flavor with my Ganesio. Also, the gemstone, that should be a big part of their culture, their lifestyle. They love gemstones. They carve them. They craft them. They make jewels of them. They make magic items with jewelry and gems. You know, this whole gemomancy, I don't know what you even call it, but crystallomancy. So magic is definitely being channeled through gemstones as well. Plus, the weaponry uh, would have gem qualities. Uh, maybe diamond edges, you know, really sharp cutting, really hard hitting or or unbreakable type of stuff. Uh, another area I wanted to tap into was, again, some more traditional stuff. The idea that Smurf Nibblin are, uh, are tuned in with the earth itself. They're able to summon elementals of earth. Uh, and this ties into the, the backstory history of my game world as well, where prior to this remaster, one of the, the main, you know, threats, the main big bad evil groups were, were the Black Earth Cult, the Black Hammer, the Dorgar were their military arm, and they were worshippers of Ogremach, a primordial of Earth. Uh, and when they took over the city, Pedestal, which, you know, was like this free city that the Smurf Nibblin were living in, the Dorgar, Oriad, etc., et the, the Black Earth Cult targeted specifically the Smurf Nibblin, my Genicio, because of this threat, because they were such powerful uh people who could summon you know the earth itself to to protect them so this definitely had to be part of my remastered version and then the last part also maybe is a bit um i think i don't want to say cliche but it's also i think traditional is that gnomes in general and these deep gnomes these furf nibbling they are they're tinkerers right they're they're masters with uh, of clockwork and such so again I had to have that as part of my my game world. Inventors, tinkering, engineering. Uh, this is also another reason why they were a threat to the Black Earth Cult and why the Durgar, you know, subjugated them as they wanted this technology that these uh, these these deep gnomes, these Genicio, were famous for. So those items, those issues, those features had to be part of my remaster. So this is the type of thing that. I would inject from my own game notes into to Kathy, into ChatGPT. I'm not just taking some, you know, website information or some book information and throwing it into ChatGPT and saying, go, make me something. Yeah, that is a huge part of it, but I also have to give it my own flavor for my own game, right? So that's part of this process as well. You can take a bunch of lore from your, your game world and fuse it with the information that is in traditional type of uh, resources such as you know monster manuals bestiaries whatever right you got you have lots of information uh and then i took that combined it with the old lore dump that i'm talking about i 
grabbed a bunch of information about the society of Sverf Niblin, their their culture, uh, their religion, their biology, their relationships. Reflavored several of these things with my own game world, but a lot of this I was getting from D and D resources, you know, wikis, uh, from you know the Five E player's handbook whatever right you're getting stuff from from all kinds of resources and i gave a bunch of this information to kathy again i i edited it and tweaked it with some of my own stuff for my own game world so that it would match better with uh obviously what i wanted her to pr um, to produce for me so i combined all that and then i did go ahead and do do the the go you know give me give me this template completed with all that information okay and i i put that into kathy and launched so here is where or what we resulted in so the first thing i got her to get into was give me a lore section for my ganicio i need their history i need their origin so i took all that info all my ideas plugged it in at various points and asked her to give me and give me some information and of course we went back and forth a few times to come up with a lore section so hey what do we come up with right hey shut up tell me what you came up with uh very good i shall sir let's go ahead and take a look at the results there we go so history and lore this is what we came up with. So Kathy gave me some stuff. I gave her some more. I asked her some questions. We went back and forth and we came up with this. Deep within the fabric of the world in a realm known as the vaults, a labyrinth of caverns as vast and complex as any surface forest or sea, the Ganicio made their home far from the light of the sun. Descended from the same fey ancestry as the surface gnomes, the Ganicio chose a path of descent their innate curiosity drawing them to the heart of the world. There they evolved into beings of stone and crystal, their essence intermingled with the elemental forces of their new domain. So here's where I took the Pathfinder lore of gnomes being fey creatures from the first world. So that could still happen, right? That could still be something that is pre-Ganicio arrival. This would then be post. And then I took that, and left that sort of dangling and then use my lore of the vaults and the concept of the ur the 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 force of the earth's energy somehow manifesting within these these fey creatures so continuing it says that the in the twilight of the under earth love that concept the under earth the Ganicio's fey nature blossomed into a culture that mirrors the resolute beauty of the gems they adore their society is a reflection of their fey origins, yet distinctly their own, where light is crafted as meticulously as metal. So this is talking about their ability to manipulate radiant energy. Where laughter echoes against stone and where a new tunnel carved is a testament to their enduring pursuit of knowledge and wonder. So they still have those fey properties of joy and freedom and exploration and light. And then you've put it into this dark world. So you can see where they are immediately going to be beacons, perhaps, of hope or targets for destruction, depending on who you talk to. The Ganicio's separation from the surface world did not come at a come without its trials. The absence of the sun and sky posed a danger of a different sort. Not the bleaching that plagues their kin, but a threat of a life devoid of discovery. The peril of eternal darkness. Their response was to become beacons in the deep, their ingenuity, their light, ensuring that the shadows are always pushed back. I really love the idea of the bleaching. This was something I had never heard of until I was reading, getting this stuff together. And so if you don't know anything about the bleaching, uh, the gnomes of, you know, Galarian, the gnomes of the Pathfinder world, they're very colorful and flamboyant and energetic. The bleaching is what it sounds like. They, they go white. They go drained of everything. I don't want to spoil it, but I have used that. So just keep your, you know, no spoilers. Anyway, against the backdrop of perpetual night, the Ganicio learned to harness the radiance of minerals, to weave light from darkness, and to ally with the stone itself. 
Their communion with earth elementals and their mastery over arcane crafts have fortified their enclaves against the pressing dark, turning seclusion into sanctuary. So here I'm I'm highlighting that that radiant again. I'm introducing the idea about the elemental earth, and they're able to to call to it when they need it, and their gem mastery powers as well. Choosing to embody Ignatio is to embrace the indomitable spirit of those who see in the pitch of the vaults, not a void, but a canvas. Love that. It's, it is to play a character who is an architect of wonders in the dark, a being whose fey roots have grown deep into the bedrock of the world. If you want a character that is an echo of mirth and the silence, the spark and the stone, the light that dances through the darkness, then you should play Ganesio. It's beautiful, right? The whole point of that last um, sentence or line or, or paragraph is to entice your players, right? This stuff up here is mostly GM kind of thing. Uh, and it does give a player who does choose uh, Ignatio, Sferf, Nibble, and Gnome, whatever, uh, it gives them some backstory they can use and weave into their character's background and their history. But this last part is the, the sales pitch, right? So all of the, the Pathfinder stuff, and they do a great job of this, the whole, um, hey, if you want... So much of Pathfinder is selling <laughs> to the players, you know what I mean? Um, so... This is great, right? I'm not like bragging like great. I mean, it's like this is just, it's a great thing that I loved when I, you know, started reading into Pathfinder and I try to make sure it appears in all of my homebrewed stuff. I'm trying to give a tease to my players. This is why you might want to pick it. I want my players going, man, I don't know who to choose because there's so many cool things, right? If I, if they say that, then I've got them. Okay. All right. Then the next part that we wanted to hit with the, remastered version of the Sferf Nibblin, my Ignatio, was Mannerisms and Perception. Uh, so let's take a look. And by the way, all the art that you're seeing was generated by Sal, who is my AI artist, uh, Dolly, which go, comes along with ChatGPT. So if you like in any of these pictures, uh, hopefully you are, because it took me a long time to generate them. And this is an example of one of my Sferf Niblin females. And I wanted to portray their hair as metallic or, or you know, like, like it's wires almost. So in this particular thing, you kind of see the idea of it's not the best. You know, I wish it was a little bit more at, at the crown of the head here. But anyway, you kind of picture she's got like a shaved head with a ponytail. Most Sferf Niblin are bald. Specifically, the males are females. Uh, they can have hair, and usually it's metallic or colorful in some way, shape, or form. All right, so the mannerisms and perceptions of these Ganesio. Let's take a look at what we came up with for this. So this is the part of the Pathfinder Ancestry where, again, it's selling itself to players. It's talking to you, the player. You might. Others probably think you are. So this is, this is you ingesting this as a potential player. So perspectives. You might find yourself more at home in the steady glow of gem-lit corridors than under the flickering light of carboxene lanterns. Carboxene is like coal, uh, you know, like a fossil fuel maybe. Actually, no, I think it's a mineral gas. It's like natural gas perhaps might be a better way to think about it. Uh, I associate that with my Dorgar who are more uh you know mechanical types of people more engineer more more synthetic more industrial might be the better word uh that is a pathfinder item carboxene i don't think that derived from D, &D but i'll have to double check so anyway i'm using it currently but that's what carboxene is uh anyway so these people they like gem light right they like radiant uh magical energy they don't like burning stuff that that's a durgar thing uh you might approach problems with a blend of practicality and creativity often finding solutions that combine traditional stonework with innovative artifice derived from magical gems and minerals so again we have this 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 concept of earthiness and then we have their their ability to be tinkering and engineer minded and then the third thing that you might, you might prefer the company of a carefully crafted clockwork device or the silent presence of an elemental. You find their thoughtful interactions preferable to the superficial exchanges most often provided by your flesh and blood fellows. So there is an element of um, 
of the population who is, you know, just into their work, into the mechanics, into the clockwork, into the tinkering, into the wind up stuff. Uh, and they don't, they don't really like to be around a lot of people yelling and, and shouting and whatever. They prefer their toys, right? Which to them, because they're animated, because they're essentially alive, that's the same thing as talking to a living person anywhere. All right, continuing. Others probably marvel at your craftsmanship, admiring the intricate jewelry and ingenious mechanical creations that seem to come naturally from your skilled hands. And one of the other things I, I like with the others probably, this helps me as a GM think about uh, NPCs. So if uh, I have players wanting to get some jewelry made, hey, I would probably seek out a Sferf Niblin, a Ganesio, because they're thought of highly as really good at making jewelry and mechanical creations. Now, from a player PC perspective, this could be good because it gives you sort of that, that idea for a class. You might pick, oh, maybe I should be an inventor. Uh, it could help you with your background. Maybe you used to be a tinkerer. Others probably rely on your expertise in navigating and surviving the treacherous depths, trusting your ability to discern safe paths through the most bewildering of underground mazes. This is something else I haven't mentioned too much yet, but the Sferf Niblin, being these bearers of light, are going to be sought out uh, by others to to lead the way or to you know shine light into the darkness. Also, there are a subgroup of um, the Sferf, the Ganesio, sorry, uh, who are you know trailblazer type of uh, people who are renowned tunnel fighters. Um, so you definitely would want them on your side if you can find them. Others probably are cautious when negotiating with you, knowing your reputation for cleverness and your ability to see through deception, a trait honed by generations living among the gemstone reflections of the Genicio enclaves. So this is kind of a, a um, tip of its hat towards illusionists a little bit, uh, towards people who are very good at using lenses, not just to magnify, you know, like magnifying glass, but actually can see truths through it so a little bit of spoiler but you can kind of see where this is building towards what feats and what heritage is uh you're going to be crafting as part of this this bigger collective this bigger ancestry physical description uh this physical description is not just important for kind of game terms but this is actually physical description that i was using as a foundation to feed into sale uh, the AI art program in order to generate some of these images and then and then iterate upon that. So it was important that I had this pretty detailed as inspirational uh, prompting for the AI art. Okay, because the AI art, uh, I know a lot of people are like, oh yeah, AI, AI art's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It is, but it's also very, I don't say dumb, but it's it's very hard to work with. Uh, you really need to have a good description you can't just say make me a gnome you know it'll it'll give you a garden gnome uh you know you're, you're trying to create fantasy creatures that are hard to reference you know what i mean like you can't like just say oh make make a picture of beyonce yeah the ai art can do something like that but it doesn't know what a ganicio is so you got to tell it you got to teach it so this is, was a big challenge uh so anyway the ganicio standing three to three and a half feet tall they weigh 40 to 45 pounds. So these guys are little guys, right? And that was another challenge with the AI art was getting it to make these creatures seem small enough that they would look like, I don't say children, but they shouldn't look like big towering humans either. Uh, so I tried to get it go earth tone with the flesh and more diminutive with the statures. It was, it was a struggle, I'll tell you that. Anyway. Uh, combine the solid build of their subterranean heritage with a pen penchant uh, for the luminous beauty of the Earth's bounty. Their skin tones are a tribute to the vaults, from stone gray to rich ore brown, often adorned with vibrant streaks of powdered gemstones, reflecting the spectrum of lights within the darkness of the realm. This was one thing I was really having a hard time with, was just getting the different skin tones, and I wish I could have gotten some more, some more earthy tones. Most of the things, I had to go with the grays just because once you got your AI going in the right direction, it was you, it was so hard to just go, oh, change the skin color to whatever. But, you know, this is a great way for you to uh, portray that even within a particular ancestry, there's going to be different looks. That was one of the disappointing things when you look at the art from the Sferf Niblin from either 5th edition or even the Pathfinder one. It's so 
boring. I mean, it's just like these pale gray dudes, you know, wearing rags, it looks like. Not not exciting at all. So I really wanted to spice that up with, with my images here. Males of the Ganesio, usually bald and beardless, might tattoo their scalps with intricate patterns of luminous mineral powders, turning their heads into canvases of radiant art. Females, that's kind of what you see here in this image, uh, females with their hair woven with threads of precious metals like gold and mithril and beads of brightly colored gems turn the functional into the magnificent, each lock a celebration of their fey lineage and the living light they carry with them. So I was really trying to get the AI art to give me females with like metallic-y hair, and that was a struggle too. Uh, a lot of times it was just hair, you know, so I wanted to get some more metal in there, and it was it was a struggle. But that is where, with this one, I, I kind of got close with the, the metallic coils uh, coming down her like dreadlock-looking uh, ponytail thing there. All right, so continuing on. Uh, their eyes glint with the clarity of finely cut jewels, capturing and reflecting even the faintest gleams, mirroring their world's inherent radiance. The Ganesio dress in materials that catch the light, fabrics that hold the glint of mica, accessories that shimmer with iridescence, and armors inset with reflective metals, luminous stones, and functional clockwork. Their clothing is not merely attire. It is a statement of defiance against the oppressive darkness, a testament to their identity as bearers of light. So yeah, as a PC, you know, Ganesio, you would be more on the flamboyant side, the more colorful side, uh, and you're you're bringing the light to the party. Uh, and that was something else I was trying to get in some of these images. Some of them I was able to do it, some I wasn't, but I felt, you know, probably within the range of people, yeah, you'd have some people more flamboyant than others. All right, Ganesio reached full maturity by their second decade with potential lifespans extending up to two and a half centuries though the harshness of their environment often promises a shorter journey. Unlike their surface cousins, Ganesio find their essence not in the novelty of experience, but in the timeless dance of light and shadow and in, in the joy of revealing the hidden beauty of the deep. Their days are measured in the steady rhythm of discovery, the unearthing of new gem veins, and the creation of objects that gleam with a light life of their own. So again, these guys enjoy living. Very different than some of the people in the underdark here or the um, vaults all right let's take a look at where we went next that was physical description so here you go this is what i was talking about the kind of the tattoos that you see around this guy's forehead and eyes that's what i was going for with the tattoos uh, and this guy's definitely got some flamboyant he's got some jewels hanging he's got kind of a nice purpley amethyst uh glittery vest going on there they want to be lit. They want to be reflective. They want to be seen. All right, then society was the next area I wanted to get into. What well, What is the society? What's the culture like that these uh, Ganesio have um, developed around them? All right, so let's take a look at that. Pull back up my notes here. Society. So the Ganesio have woven the stoneward code. Now, this goes into my idea, again, that I was talking about with these guys being like... Uh, Eastern, uh, that, uh, you know, Japanese samurai, the, the, the code of the warrior, the, the, uh, what is it? The Bushido, uh, you know, warriors. Um, so that is definitely part of their ancestry, but it's not just warriors. And that's what I'm talking about here. So the Ganesio have woven the stoneward code into the fabric of a society that is as enduring as the subterranean stones and as intricate as the clockwork mechanisms they are renowned for crafting. In their cavernous cities, the clang of the smith's hammer accompanies the whisper of the gem cutter's blade, while the hum of finely turned machinery, tuned machinery, underscores every aspect of daily life. The most esteemed families among the Ganesio are those who have, generation after generation, combined martial prowess with unmatched artisanal skill, shaping metal and stone into marvels of both beauty and utility. So from what I remember uh, with, you know, samurai, they were not just, you know, killers with swords. They were lords. They were intelligent. They were artistic. They had to know what calligraphy and art. Uh, so I wanted that that vibe here with these with these Ganesio. I wanted them to be sure you could have your warriors with their gem blades and cutting people down if needed. Uh, but I also wanted them to be very artistic uh part of the uh, which would manifest in their their gem work their jewelry 
also in their their clockwork in their tinkering and all of this is their code the their their honor and their society is divided into you know like clans or um again i'm not sure the exact word in in eastern cultures um you know asian cultures but that whole idea you know family and honor is super important to this to these uh, Genishio. and i think that's something that would set them apart from any of the other stone races like the Dorgar or the Oriet. So these guys are very, you know, family, clan, honor, that type of thing. And they just want to improve and better. And again, this is also what makes them very attracted to Kavarka, uh, one of my primordials, who is the this god of perfection, um, radiance, beauty. Continuing, education in Genishio communities extends beyond traditional lore and into the realms of mechanical mastery. Their loads are not just centers for learning. This would be their name that they would call their their cities, um, their communities it's called loads. Uh, they're not just centers for learning, or maybe that's like their name of their of their it could just be their uh, academic institutions. I don't know. I have to think about that more. Uh, this was a, a term that Kathy proposed. I liked it, you know, like lodestone. Uh, so I like the concept, exactly what it's defining. Is that what they call a city or is that what they call their university? I don't know. Their loads are not just centers for learning, but also workshops where young minds are shaped to think like clockwork, to be precise, efficient, and innovative. That's kind of spooky sounding almost, right? You can kind of see where that would, that could take a twist. Uh, these places are where budding tinkerers first lay their hands on tools where seasoned inventors pass down the secrets of their craft. Artistic expression in these halls is an alloy of discipline and inspiration, yielding creations that epitomize the fusion of form and function. A sword that sings with the purity of crystal, a golem whose heart beats with a clock's precision. Yeah, so the load sounds like it's a university, so it's like there's schools. And that's actually kind of interesting because you could tie this into the new wizard schools that uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remastered has uh, released because they, they got rid of the traditional eight schools of magic from D&D and they've replaced them with um, more creative schools. So you could imagine like the Lodestone School or whatever of wizardry and artifice could focus on, you know, this sort of a, of training. That's an interesting idea. Honor in Gideshio culture is as much about the sharpness of one's intellect as the strength of one's arm. It is displayed in the intricate mechanisms of defense that guard their homes and the complex jewelry that adorns their leaders. Disputes of innovation and design are often settled in contests that showcase the ingenuity and resourcefulness of their creators. Echoing the ancient duels of honor with a modern twist where the mind's edge is as crucial as any blades. So I kind of like this concept because I'm thinking, yeah, back in the ancient olden days, the Ganesio, they would have been like dueling with blades and stabbing and killing each other. But now in more modern times... Uh, you know, even inventors can have a duel, kind of think like a chess match almost. So you're not out there killing somebody because they've, you know, dishonored you or they've, you're accusing them of stealing your invention or your ideas, right? They're more, they could be, you know, com uh, more science comp science fair competition almost type of thing. Uh, you know, whoever builds the rocket fastest type of thing. That could be a fun, interesting concept. You could see that even be like a plot hook or some sort of story element that you that you bring out. Right, some cool ideas I thought were coming out of this whole process. All right, then we moved on to the naming conventions. And by the way, here's a great example of sort of a re-envisioned Ganesio. These, especially with the females, as I mentioned, they have a lot of gems and jewels and, and uh, precious metals woven through their hair. They're using, uh, you know, well, hair dye, but they're using different gem colors in order to shade uh, they're, they're normally, you know, uh, stony features that are gray and tan and earthy browns. They've got potentially tattoos, uh, in their flesh from the, like, could be, could be warp stone, which would give them power, which you'll, spoiler, you'll see later. Or it could just be decorative, you know, micas and that sort of thing. Uh, some sort of sparkly stuff. But, you know, here you have like a, a Ignatio female. She looks like she's some sort of inventor clockwork you know she's working some some device in a, in a workshop so she's inventive and she's beautiful i really like the idea that these these they're not just spurp nibbling gray moping around the caverns and you know whatever grabbing gems i mean that's lame 
sorry to the original, you know, people who came up with that, those drawings, those Nishi over there were so lame. The ones that were in the monster, the uh, DMs, whatever, the the 5e uh, player's handbook and the one in the Pathfinder. Ugh, guys, those, those, the art is terrible. Anyway, so what's going on with the naming for my Ganesha? So take a look. Uh, naming names within Ganesha society often reflect an individual's knack for invention with titles bestowed upon those who bring significant advancements to their crafts. The Ganesha take pride in these appellations for they speak not only to personal achievement, but also to the collective progress of their entire civilization. To be Ganesha is to be an integral gear in the great clockwork of their society. So they see themselves all working together in this harmonious machine where every turn of the wrench and every carved rune contributes to the grand design of their underground world. So they're definitely a united group. Uh, sample names. Gem root names would be like their family, their clan names. Uh, and these would relate to the type of mineral typically or the, the gem that the, the family is known for to craft with. So crystal fist, onyx vein, emerald dory, you know, whatever. You can come up with whatever goofy kind of sounding name you want. Given names, these would be inspired by virtues, elements of their underground environment or desired qualities. You know, the glint shields, the echo blades, the deep forges, the lumen reaches. So, you know, kind of like your 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 job, your your destiny sort of thing. Uh, and honorifics and titles, Ganesio may also have titles that signify their role in the society, uh, which they would put before or after names as, you know, their warden or sentinel, their lore gem, forge keeper, you name it. So as an example... Uh, a full Ganesio name could be something like Glint Shield Quartz Whisper or Lord Gem of the em Emerald Ori Clan. You could throw in, you know, Susie Lord Gem if you wanted to. Uh, you know, because that's one problem when you kind of do fantasy names or name generators. A lot of times they're either complete gibberish or they're really kind of ham-fisted a little bit here where they're, they're a little bit too literal. So I would like to mix it up. Would probably, I'd probably have to take another swing at this with Kathy and, and say, hey, I like some of these you know, root names, but let's give them also some sort of normal names to kind of fuse in with them. But anyway, I do like the concept that she's pitching here that um, you've got the names of the stone perhaps you're working on, the gem. you got the names of like the family's you know, virtues that ties into the honor, the stone word code concept. I think really could you could really go into that cultural aspect some more. The whole Stoneward Code, the the major family names, and just as a side note, in my previous game world, there was a group of clans that were derived from. There was a guild uh, that was derived from the old clans of the Sverf Niblin prior to them being, uh, you know taken down by the black earth cult the dorgar uh and their guild's name was the ten tremors and it was kind of again sort of a homage to like you know yakuza because they were a crime you know organization within the refugee camps of the vaults uh so the idea that there were 10 you know powerful families of sferf niblin who were the pinnacle of their society how that ties into this you know i'd have to think about it because i hadn't hadn't made that connection yet until i was starting to put this all final together here and I was thinking huh I need to go back and look at my notes on the 10 tremors and see because I don't know how much I got into their their lore and history but I now I can now I have this and again I'm going to give another praise to um to Pathfinder because in D&D &D, you don't necessarily have to think of all this stuff uh because there's nothing in D&D &D that really from the rule book anyway that inspires you to to go in a specific direction. Um, and I really gotta say, I mean, a lot of people give D&D sort of a lot of props that, oh, it's this really creative, inventive game. And it is, but to me, it's more so because the the players and the DMs are like that. It's not like you read the book and the book is giving you these great ideas. The books are pretty lame, uh, to be honest with you. A lot of the best lore I ever found with D&D was in the old books, fourth edition, third edition, second edition. Fifth edition is trash when it comes to lore, I'm sorry. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff was stripped out when they were printing those just to make the books as you know small as they could and get as much money as they could. Anyway, side note, Pathfinder, though, when you go through the book and they have this type of format with each of their ancestors, it really starts getting you thinking. There's a lot of lore built into their game books. And so 
when you're doing your homebrew, you're doing your own conversions, it's just natural for you to go ahead and, and follow their lead. So I love that. And that's why I was saying, I really hadn't thought about it until I was putting this together, that my 10 Tremors, which was a criminal organization that I had on, you know, some notes on, on a paper, I had some of their leaders. I bet you I can tie them into this now. You know, maybe these are their historical families, their, their above board groups, but then the, you know, necessity of uh, survival required them to become more criminal organizations. Anyway, whole nother conversation that we could have, which we don't have time for. Uh, let's go ahead and get into what was next. So then we got into the belief section. What do the Ganesio believe? Uh, definitely stuff about gems and light and radiance and invention and tinkering is going to be part of their, their lore, part of their religion, part of their belief system. Uh, and this is where Kavarka, my primordial of radiance, of crystals, of perfection and wealth, definitely ties into to this to this um to this ancestry that was one of the reasons i picked this ancestry to go first because i had been just working on kavarka and his cult the luminite lattice prior to these videos so again if you haven't seen any of that stuff go back and look at uh, the videos i made over the last couple weeks you'll see there's lots of lore about the luminite lattice the, the this radiant cult uh and kavarka who is their their their, their radiant sovereign so let's take a look at what Kathy and I came up with for the belief structure. Scoot this down. So the Ganesio, these earthen fey folk, molded by the eternal stones of the vaults, embody a fusion of ancient warrior honor and elemental mysticism encapsulated in their stone word path. Is that called stone word code up here? Just want to double check. Stone word codes. Yeah, stone word code would probably be a better way of calling it. Typo. Code. All right, this philosophy extols community, individual resilience, and the sanctity of craftsmanship. Revering both the forge's fire and the gem's facet, the Ganesio elevate their work beyond mere trade to spiritual service where precision and ingenuity are sacred. Each creation, be it a jeweled amulet or a gear in a clockwork device, holds the creator's essence, binding them to their stoneward vows of integrity and contribution. So you can see their honor is everything. Their artisanry is, is everything. And now as a PC, you have this information. It really helps you role play your character. As a GM, it really helps you role play NPCs or design a, a settlement that the Ganesio are running or a shop that perhaps they're running. This is like a religious thing. So if you go into their shop and disrespect their creations or somehow say, oh, this is trash, uh, you might really hurt their feelings or really piss them off. Depends on who it is. Ganesio artisans and warriors alike are marked by patience and a profound drive to refine the world with their crystal and mechanical magics. Their workshops are altars to diligence and their forges ring with the hymns of creation. This dedication to craft is mirrored in their deep-seated belief that each action, each invention, ripples through their society, affirming the collective's well-being as paramount. So they definitely would be, because I haven't created all my primordials yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a primordial in their future that is going to be, I actually have an idea for one that's mechanical, spoiler. Uh, I definitely can see these guys digging that. Hmm. All right, let's keep going. In worship, many Ganesio honor Sunus. Now this, I need to edit still. I'm going to underline this. Uh, because this is a D&D &D holdover. There is a primordial entity. She is like a female earth elemental. Kind of like Kavarka. Kind of like Ogremach. Uh, and kind of in my loose lore idea, she was, I think she's going to be Ogremach's sister. Ogremach's like the big, bad, evil guy of the Black Earth called Trapped Primordial. Anyway, she is the Lodestone Lady, the True Stone. She's like a magnetic, right? She's pointing true north. Uh, in worship, many Gnishio honor her, who unerringly guides her children home alongside the memory of the ancient Earth Callers, who bound themselves, who bound their fates with Petra's elemental spirits to deliver the first Gnisio from darkness. Petra, I believe, is the name of the uh, the stone elemental plane of stone. I think that's what Pathfinder's calling it. That's what I'm calling it anyway. 
Uh, a growing number pledged themselves to the crystalline titan Kavarka. I already mentioned him. The unblemished lord. That is my homebrewed version of a older D&D &D primordial. Again, go back and watch those videos if you want to know what I'm talking about. Seeing his luminous path to perfection as the goal for their own lives. So they've got Sunus as the true stone, the, the pointing their way home, a guide. You've got Kavarka, perfection. Uh, some Ganesha whisper blasphemous prayers to, to Tink and Felzer. Now, Tink and Felzer are gods. These would be the parents of the primordials. And the gods in the game world, the ones on the surface, the gods of the heavens, are forbidden. They are, like, bad. Not really. They're just portrayed that way. Uh, because they're believed to have abandoned the people here in the vaults. Uh, so the people in the vaults are worshipping the outcast children of the gods and those primordials. But anyway, Tink and Felzer would be gods of, you know, sculpting, clockwork, uh, smithing, metalwork, etc. So anyway, some will be whispering blasphemous prayers. I forgot to put this in here. Uh, blessing, seeking blessings to imbue their hands with the skill to craft mechanisms rival, rivaling the complexity of life itself. Of the sculpt, yeah, okay. Even rarer, among the gem blades, there is secret tribute to Valor, the stalwart defender, another god of the surface world, seeking his guidance for their blades and martial strategies. I may have to come back and revise this a little bit because I need more of my primordials developed before I can just say, oh, there's only a couple of primordials they might be into. There might be others that they could they could see as like I said, there was that mechanical one I was I was talking about. I don't want to say anything more. Uh, but anyway. Continuing, popular edicts and anathemas. The Ganesio are taught to master their crafts, innovate with reverence for tradition, and uphold the subterranean balance. They are encouraged to seek wisdom in the Earth's hidden facets, pursuing discovery through light and shadow, and to share their mechanical genius for the common good. Anathemas, turning from one's duty, misusing skills for selfish gain, and hoarding knowledge are the gravest breaches of the Stoneward Path. Stoneward Code misapplying their gifts uh especially in the construction of oppressive tools so basically making let's say uh, firearms breaks the sacred trust that unites their community the path of isolation is shunned for disconnection from the stoneward code and the Ganesio community leads only to spiritual erosion so you know you're supposed to be happy-go-lucky and partying with your your neighbors you know the community so that would definitely be anathema to them these uh concepts by the way this is what's replacing alignment in pathfinder all right then the last part of this whole lore section is the adventures part this is a very valuable tool i didn't see this in the remaster version though this was in sidebars in the in the core rulebook in the players section where they would have i thought little sidebars that would give you ideas of why you'd want to be an adventurer of a particular, you know, particular ancestry. So I had it in my versions, my older ones, and I was starting the remaster before the remaster came out. And all of a sudden the remaster came out and I didn't see it in there. I don't know, I'll look again. But anyway, this section gets into, for players mostly, why would a member of your ancestry seek adventure? Because adventuring, especially in the vaults, is extremely dangerous. I mean, your your life expectancy is, you know, a few years at best. So why would you sign up for something that's dangerous? Uh, let's take a look. So Ganesio adventurers often embark on their journeys driven by the deep-seated desire to bring light to the darkest corners of the world and to showcase the splendor of their subterranean craftsmanship. Some may feel a calling to venture beyond their familiar tunnels to safeguard their kin from emerging threats, while others are motivated by an insatiable curiosity to uncover the lost secrets and ancient magic that pulse within the Earth's depths. These adventurers are characterized by their resourcefulness, innovation, and a profound sense of duty. Before venturing into the perilous life of adventuring, many Ganesio had honed their skills and professions that are now the bedrock of their journey. Some were esteemed gem cutters, their days spent within the sparkling confines, sorry, I gotta fix that, uh, confines of jewelers' workshops where they shaped rough stones and brilliant gems. Their keen eyes and steady hands now served them well in discerning the hidden dangers and treasures of the vaults. Others stood as sentries, guardians whose vigilance, I don't know if that should be capitalized or not, 
uh, sentries, maybe that's a title, uh, guardians whose vigilance and combat prowess were tested against the lurking threats of the deep. Skills that now proved invaluable in protecting their companions in the wild tunnels. There were also tinkerers, the ingenious minds behind the myriad of clockwork creations that pulsed through Genicio society. Their craft involved not just metal and gears, but the very elements of magic, making them adept at deciphering ancient mechanisms and arcane traps they encounter on their travels. Lastly, many Genicio were scholars dedicated to the pursuit of ancient knowledge, poring over runes and relics. These scholars carry with them the deep understanding of the world's forgotten magics, ready to unveil the secrets that lie in the heart of the earth and in the forgotten corners of the Serp's world. All right, so this paragraph is presenting possible backgrounds for your PCs. So for the players, they're trying to come up with a character background, character story. This paragraph is giving that them that giving them that information. That's why I think Kathy was capitalizing this stuff. I think she was because when I asked her to do this, I said, um, "Hey, why would these Kenisha want to be adventurers?" That's that opening paragraph, really. And then the next thing I said was, "Well, what kind of backgrounds might they have in Pathfinder terms?" I don't know that these are specific Pathfinder 2E backgrounds, and that's why she's capitalizing them. But anyway, it gives you an example of four areas that you might have come from. You know, a gem cutter, a sentry, one of these scholars, or one of the, uh, what was the other one, the tinkerer types. So it gives you some some flavor, gives you some concepts. All right, uh, this is one of my gem colors that I have over here in this picture. I really like that picture. Then the next one, I really like this picture. This is one of, oh man, I don't want to spoil it. There is a heritage that ain't looking so pretty, and I kind of spoil it a little bit earlier when I when I alluded to it. But I'm not going to say anything else because we haven't talked about heritages yet. But that's coming. Uh, next video, I think. As Genicio stepped forth from the intricate caverns of the vaults, into the life of adventure, they carry with them a legacy of craftsmanship and guardianship that naturally predisposes them to certain callings. So this is going to give the players some ideas of what um, maybe classes they might be good at. Their life admits shadows makes them natural rogues with a talent for stealth, disarming traps, and revealing hidden paths. Now a lot of this is just flavor, not any pure mechanics, but it is also alluding to potential heritages that might be locked in or linked to some of these in a mechanical sense. Again, I don't want to spoil too much. Uh, those who stood as sentinels often emerge as formidable fighters, their martial discipline forged in the defense of their subterranean homes. With a culture rich in clockwork and arcane gems, many Genicio become inventors, melding magic with mechanics to craft wondrous inventions that accompany them on their quests. The elemental and fey magic coursing through their veins beckons them towards the mystical arts, leading some to pursue the scholarly path of wizards and others to embrace the innate power of sorcerers. The Gnisio's profound history stretching as far back as their escape from the first world. So I did leave that concept in here. I didn't explore it. I just left it as, hey, they came from the first world, so we can still tie into Pathfinder uh, if they come out with their own Darkland stuff and their own deep gnomes or whatever. I still... I still have a connection. I still have a connection to the surface gnomes. Followed by their centuries as part of the three kingdoms. The three kingdoms is a concept I have, and that is the three kingdoms are the 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 Smurf Nibble and the Ganesio, the Durgar, and the Oread, which are the earth elementals of I'm sorry, Earth Genasi, Genikin of Pathfinder. So those three stone people had formed the three kingdoms in ancient times. So Sverf Nibblin gnomes, they leave the first world. The Sverf Nibblin descend into the depths. They evolve as Genicio and then become part of this three kingdoms. Anyway, this long history inspires them to become bards, spinning tales and songs that resonate with the magic of their ancient world. Each class they choose is a reflection of their deep connection to the earth and the ingenuity that defines their people, ensuring that wherever they roam, the Genicio bring the light of their culture to illuminate the darkest quarters of the world. Choice. That is beautiful, guys and gals. Wow. All right. A lot of that, again, I 
put a bunch of stuff into Kathy. She gave me a bunch of stuff. We went back and forth. This is the first time I'm really just reading through it all, you know, because when you're when you're making it, you're just going back and forth and and in the in the immediacy. Here you're just stepping back and looking at the forest, and it is like it's beautiful. I'm again, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to brag, but I I'm I'm digging this. All right, last thing, let's wrap this up, shall we? This is getting very, very long, but hopefully it's worth it. Hopefully you're seeing the complete ancestry that I, I came up with here using using Sal for art, using Kathy for inspiration and helping with the 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 uh the lore here. And the last thing I wanted to put together with Kathy's help was the mechanics. So this was the you know the hard part as far as the numbers. So here's what we did. I took developed all that lore that you just saw. All my my goals I set forth for this for this this race, this ancestry. And I said, hey, can you give me a set of mechanics that you know matches Pathfinder 2E version based upon everything we've talked about? And here's what she proposed, and then I've since revised it. So mechanically speaking, in the world of the vaults, Ganicio, the Spurf Niblin, they are common. They're all over the place. Hit points, eight. That's average. Size small, we've already established that. Speed 25, no need to change that. I went with the original more D, D version, Dex and Intelligence, and then the free boost, because that fits better with my earthy mechanical, you know, inventor types. These fit their stats better than constitution and charisma, which would be the more fey, smarty pants, uh, you know, whatever gnomes that are are galarian surface gnomes ability flaw strength they're not the strongest uh that kind of ties into their fey ancestry they're they're fairly frail and skinny a lot of them um although there are warriors amongst them so that that's always the problem when you kind of use the flaw system it's sort of this is why some people don't want to use the flaw systems because it kind of encourages people not to go in a certain direction like oh i won't make a fighter ganicio then no you can you can just use your free boost you know pretty much to erase the penalty here um you know it just means that you can't get an 18 out of the box with your with your fighter but to me that's fine because these guys are they're kind of weaker right they're normally smaller and 18 strength is like the strongest right um and so if you got a human who's 18 and then there's a little ganicio who weighs 40 pounds is also 18 that guy would be like, like a little Hulk running around. It wouldn't make any sense. So the fact that they're naturally a little bit weaker, you know, that's fine. It just goes with their stature. All right. Languages. Under common and gnomish, of course. And then this was really interesting. So this was actually, and again, I'm going to give props where they're due. Kathy came up with this idea uh, initially, and then I loved it. I was like, dude. That's genius. And then we we refined it so that it would it made more mechanical sense. So she proposed that these Ganicio had a way of using kind of like Morse code. And they were like using little flashy uh, light, right? Because they're all in the radiance. They're all in the gems. They're all into reflective surfaces. They have that whole branch of their of their heritage that gets into into that sort of light manipulation stuff. So why not like some sort of signaling gem light signaling like a secret code a secret language so Ganesio have honed a distinctive mode of silent communication and i have this in a couple of my others uh ancestries as well the my darklings my caligny they have like a shadow puppet kind of signing language but so this was like cool they utilize the reflective qualities of gems and precise angling of polished surfaces to emit coded flashes of light this allows them to convey complex messages across distances up to 150 feet this i don't know if that's you know mechanically sound or not but 150 feet i thought that was fair you know that's going to cover most you know distances provided there's line of sight of course uh ambient light must be dim enough enough for the flashes to be distinguishable so if you're in a br brightly lit cavern for some reason this isn't going to work very effectively uh but if you're in low light darkness yeah for sure you can see these little winks of light while non ganicio can detect the presence of these signals, the subtleties and meaning are lost to them. This form of communication is especially valuable for coordinating tactics, warning of danger, or signaling an all clear without revealing the sender's exact location or intent to the uninitiated. So a monster or whatever might see these little flashes of light, but not know where, wait, what, where's that at exactly? What are they saying? They know somebody's over there, but exactly where and what they're talking about, they don't know. Uh, traits. Gnome or Ganicio, humanoid would be the two traits. I might have 
They might be Fey. They might be Elemental Stone. I gotta look at that some more. I gotta check, uh, take a look at regular gnomes. I gotta take a look at um, the genie kin, the Oread, and see if they are. So that might need to be updated. We'll have to see. Uh, traits, for those of you who don't know, that would be, you know, like there's spells or effects or weapons or whatever that affect certain um, traits. So, like, you might have Humanoid Slain Arrow. So, if you have the Humanoid trait, you're going to take double damage. So, it's stuff like that that you want to be aware of. So, you, you don't necessarily want a bunch of traits because then you might be susceptible to a bunch of, you know, things that you don't want to be susceptible to. Uh, here it is. So, now here's where maybe the controversy part gets into for some people. But I gave them three, three starting traits. One of them is what Pathfinder normally gives everybody anyway. And... The gnome of Pathfinder gets low light vision. Well, pretty much every single ancestry I'm creating for my Darklands vaults under dark is in the dark, so they need vision that's going to work. Otherwise, everybody's blinded immediately. So, right? So, the low light vision is not really a special ability. So, cross this off as far as, oh, you're giving them three things. I'm really only giving them two. Everybody's got to have at least low light vision, although there are a couple exceptions. Uh, it's the dark vision that would be the special thing. And even some of my ancestries are going to right out of the box have dark vision. I think like my Durgar do. Um, but these guys have low light vision. And the way that rationalizes to me is that because they are living normally in kind of brightly lit areas with gemstones and they're from you know, the surface, the the fey, uh, the first world, it makes sense that they naturally had regular light vision but now they come down here and over however thousands hundreds of thousands of years they've been here they have low light vision naturally then these next two are you know flavor kind of things so this is where i'm saying that even though you're giving them extra stuff my game world's difficulty is going to be such that they're going to need it and the things i'm choosing i'm i'm not going to give broken powers i want to give them a little bit more flavor uh, that makes this Svrfniblin conversion more Svrfniblin-y from my original vision uh, and specific, you know, unique to the game world. That's not something you have to go and spend a feat on. So here's what I have. They have Crystal Focus and they have Artisan of the Depths. So these two abilities are fairly benign. Crystal Focus, like the crystals and minerals that weave through the rocks of the vaults, you seem to be a concentration and focal point for the Earth's Ur energy you can cast the light spell as an innate primal cantrip once per day so you can cast light once a day the end uh i forget how long light lasts what is it, an hour 10 minutes i don't know uh that might need to get a time limit i'll have to go and double check but right you get it you get the ability to cast light that that is um you know reflect their ability to radiate and use gems and cause things to glow so kind of picture like gandalf with his staff and the crystal at the top and he's blowing on it and it lights up kind of see it like that with these these uh Ganesio. and then artisan of the depths uh your long tradition of intricate craftsmanship makes you naturally skilled artisan you get a plus two circumstance bonus on crafting checks when working with and not everything right metal gems clockwork okay chosen at character creation so you have to choose one of these so crafting metal crafting gems crafting clockwork it's a plus two bonus it's not going to make or break the game okay so that's the key thing you know if you're going to homebrew don't be afraid to homebrew some extra stuff uh but i you know two things would be just make sure it's not going to break your game like give these huge bonuses like the largest bonus i've seen is a plus two so you know i can make this a plus one but because I'm limiting it to just one thing, a plus two is fine. If I was doing any crafting check, I'd say plus one. Uh, but, you know, at best, it's a plus two on a single check uh, that you have to choose and you're locked into it for the rest of your character. So if you never, ever craft gems, well, then it doesn't do anything for you. But it's flavorful. It's thematic. That's the other thing that you want to have it tie into and enhance that particular, uh, you know, ancestry. All right. That's is that guys uh i have i have gone over my limit i've exceeded the limit on what i want to talk about but hopefully you saw what i was doing i mean we went all in on this thing and so next session is going to be 
the next part of this, and that is the heritages. I've I've teased them a couple times. I've almost slipped a couple times and told you some stuff. You saw some pictures that were suggestive, uh, but I've got six what I think are super interesting, unique, awesome heritages for my Ganesio uh, that should hopefully blow your mind. So if you're interested in seeing what that's all about, what I've come up with, I invite you to go ahead and join uh, join me in the next uh, the next video. If you want to know when that's going to be, hopefully in the next day or so, you're going to have to hit the like button, right? You're going to have to subscribe. You're going to have to notification so that you're ready when that puppy comes out. Otherwise, you might miss it. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and do the heritages. That's going to be the next video. And then the video after that is probably going to wrap up this whole Ganesio ancestry with the feats because the feats are going to be... That's going to take a while. Um, I'm going to... Gonna, grab from the gnome stuff and then homebrew from there and that might be some real-time live uh, creations as well just kind of kind of show you how that works as, uh, on top of everything else anyway we've gone over an hour holy cow uh but i'm glad you were here i'm glad you got to see what's going on and hopefully this was you know some inspiration for you so for the if you're out there looking for wanting to homebrew your own pathfinder stuff go for it why not uh, if you're, you know, a player and you're looking for ideas of ancestries or something like that, hey, talk to your GM. Maybe you can work with your GM to figure out a homebrewed uh, version of whatever that you want to play. All right. Until the next video, have yourselves a good night and peace out.